2023 is coming to an end, and what a year it was. The year was so action-packed in Starbase that we wanted to wind the clock all the way back to January and walk through all of the important milestones SpaceX managed to surpass. Two flights, multiple tests, and more vehicles than I can count on my fingers, this is Starbase in 2023. Sponsored by Brilliant. The year began with a full focus on Booster 7 and Ship 24. Remember them? We saw a roll of Booster 7, which had previously been worked on in the Mega Bay. The booster was rolled out to the OAM for what we hoped would be the last time. Just later that week, we saw Ship 24 and Booster 7 stacked for pre-launch testing at the beginning of the month. At this time, we anticipated it would be for a wet dress rehearsal. Indeed, the stack performed a partial LOX and methane load test on the orbital launch mount. It wasn't the full shebang, but it was certainly a step in the right direction. Later in January, the stack performed a full propellant load test to verify every single system for launch. At the same time, Ship 25, as we know now, the second stage of the second flight attempt was rolled out to suborbital pad B for engine testing. Unfortunately, it just sat there for a month and did nothing else, but hey, it was there. But our hope that this would be the last and final stack of the first flight stack did not last long. Just a few days later, Ship 24 was destacked and rolled back to the Rocket Garden for what was speculated at the time as the last work ahead of launch. Around this time, at the beginning of February, we also saw the arrival of the part for the deluge system to Starbase. We of course now know that this system would be operational for the second flight and work very well. Do you know what also started in February of 2023? Starbase update! This very series isn't even a year old. Back then on February 6th, Jack started off the series. In this first Starbase update, we explained the potential work they would perform to get Ship 24 back to the launch site and that Booster 7 has lost three Raptor engines, which were replaced. And then it was time for a big event at Starbase, the 31 engine static fire of Booster 7. Initially planned as a 33 engine static fire, one engine was disabled pre-firing and one aborted during spin-up. But still, overall, a massive test and at that point it was the most thrust produced at Starbase ever. At this point, the old FireX deluge system seemed fine as we did not spot any meaningful damage to the launch site. However, time would tell that this came down to the lower thrust settings on the test. In the aftermath of that test, we also saw the rollout of Ship 26, a flapless, tireless ship that has some haters and lovers amongst the community and the NSF team. Back then, the Massey's test area was not yet performing cryo tests of ships, just boosters, so Ship 26 underwent pressure testing on suborbital pad A. Also, this rollout gives us a great opportunity to take a look at a much different production site skyline. There's no second mega bay or smaller star factory. The dishes are still there. The windbreak is still there. A lot has changed with this world-class R&D facility in just 10 months. And that landing marks the 253rd ever booster landing, the 173rd consecutively, and the 23rd to happen on a Wednesday when the moon is 23.6 degrees above the horizon. Yes, our spreadsheets run deep here at NSF, but they're really boring. They're basically just Excel spreadsheets. Know how we could really get more data out of it? By using a course about how to visualize data better using today's sponsor, Brilliant.org. Brilliant is the best way to learn about different math, science, and computer-related topics, all interactively. Their course on exploring data visually is great for finding out how to get the most out of your data, whether it's targeting Starbucks customers or figuring out the best way to view data about rocket boosters. Now you can get a 30-day free trial just by visiting Brilliant.org slash NASA Spaceflight or by clicking the link in the description below. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Now let me ask Alex how many launches happened from Pad 40 when Venus was in the night sky. Why? Don't ask. Moving back to the first flight campaign, we saw Booster 7 getting a new hydraulic power unit, which proved to be quite problematic in the overall test campaign and also performed a single engine spin prime test. Early March surprised us then as suddenly a booster lift configured SPMT rolled to the launch site and Booster 7 was removed from the OLM. Back then, DAS updated us on the sudden development in another Starbase update. We also saw the installation of the heavy and proper shielding of the OLM during this time, which is still there today. 
The most likely reason for the booster removal back then was the fact that they needed to access systems related to the OAM that they could not reach with the booster in the way. Booster 7 then returned to the OAM once this work had finished. Around this time, we released a daily video with the text Drilling for Pilings for a New Building, which we now know as the new Mega Bay. Yes, this started in March, and today we have a practically completed building. At the end of March, we got some updates on the timeline for Starship's first flight, as Elon Musk expected a launch in just about two weeks. A timeline that extended a bit, but was not far off. Flight 1 of Starship at this point was getting closer and closer, and everybody in the space community could feel the adrenaline increasing day by day. What also happened around this time was the stacking of Booster 10, the very booster we now observe on the OAM getting ready for Flight 3. We also saw Massey's kick into gear as Ship 25 was preparing for a cryotest campaign just down Highway 4. Then it was time for the final rollout, for real this time. Ship 24 returned from the high base bar after some tile work and returned to the launch site for the final few days. This was just 16 days before it would launch atop B7. The countdown was on, and so was our countdown to launch series, which started around this time for the first time also. The final D-stack happened just hours before the launch as SpaceX armed the flight termination system. This was the final box to be ticked. And then on the first attempt, on Monday the 17th of April, well, it scrubbed. A frozen valve on the pressurization system for the oxygen tank aborted the countdown, and they did not leave the pad that day. But after all, the day it finally launched probably should have been suspected for a long time. Elon's favourite day, 420. On the 20th, SpaceX performed the countdown and we indeed saw the liftoff of the most powerful rocket of all time. 31 Raptors ignited on the booster and then quickly started to drop as a fire in the engine bay deleted them one by one. While exciting, the first flight did not reach stage separation or any useful flight profile. It did, however, provide a ton of data and experience for the SpaceX team, which saw what worked, and probably more so, what didn't. Of course, another system they already suspected would be problematic was the fire suppression system, known as FireX. The system was not able to contain the power of the Raptors during throttle up, and the so called rock tornado damaged the pad, tanks, equipment, and also an innocent van. So SpaceX had some stuff to do. They wanted to install the new steel plate deflector for Flight 2. Also, the tank farm got some heavy hits, so SpaceX obviously had to repair those. At the beginning of May, SpaceX moved back into the flight test campaign for Flight 2. We saw the cryogenic testing of Ship 25 at the Massey site. We also saw the removal of the ship quick disconnect for repairs and what we know now, hot staging modifications. Overall, the whole launch site was incredibly busy at this time. Everywhere something was repaired or replaced and it was hard to look at everything that was changing every single day. The Deluge tank farm and Deluge system were of course a major focus for us and the community. Everybody was curious about how this system worked. At this point, we also observed the big skyline change picking up the pace. The old prefabrication building was relocated to the storage yard as Star Factory started the work on its expansion. In mid-June, Ship 25 entered engine testing on suborbital Pad B with an aborted and later successful Spin Prime test. It was rolled out all the way from Massey's to Pad B. And all you experienced tank watchers know what follows a spin prime, a static fire of all six Raptor engines. This was the first engine testing of the second Starship launch campaign. In July, SpaceX rolled out the new deluge plate or upside down showerhead to the launch site. This steel plate would fire water powered by nitrogen against the fire of the Raptor engines. It features many very small openings from which the water would dispense at high pressure. The ship QD also returned at this time, now modified for the taller Starship stack, as SpaceX decided to add an extra ring to the top of Super Heavy that we know as the hot staging ring. The deluge plate was then installed under the orbital launch mount, where concrete pouring had taken place over the previous weeks, filling the crater left behind by Booster 7. The associated deluge manifolds were also rolled out as SpaceX installed the system. Now it's showerhead time. In mid-July, the plate came to life in its first partial test, and it looked magnificent. So now, with that system being tested, the path was clear for a booster return to the OAM. And Booster 9 did exactly that. Three months after the first flight, a booster was once again on the orbital launch mount. 
The future shows that this turnaround time can be reduced, but we're not there just yet. In what seemed to be a test of the tank farm, Booster 9 then was tested on the OLM in a full cryogenic proof test. This could have been also to verify all the damage and repairs to the orbital tank farm, but we never received official confirmation. And if you thought they wouldn't test the deluge at full force with a booster on the pad, you would be surprised. A full pressure deluge test was performed at the end of July, with Booster 9 being a witness. Around this time, we also got a first peek at the hot staging test article that SpaceX would test at the Massey's test site. This was needed for structural verification of the system, as it would have to hold a lot of force during flight. Another wink from the future happened this time as well, as we saw Ship 28, now the flight candidate for the third flight test, performing some cryo testing at Massey's. With all of this talk about the deluge system, there was of course only one way to properly verify it pointing some engines at it and letting it do what it does best. And that is exactly what SpaceX did. The first static fire tried to ignite 33 Raptor engines. Of the 33, four shut down and the test ended only 50% of the way through, which sparked the need for a redo. At least the deluge system got some testing under its belt and from what we could tell performed without an issue. After rolling back to the production site, Booster 9 attended its coronation, receiving its crown in the Mega Bay. This wasn't the Pathfinder ring that was tested at Massey's, it was a separate article, although they do appear almost identical. While the booster was taking a rest, the deluge system was tested once more. What followed was a weird few weeks with several stacks, D-stacks, hot staging ring installations, hot staging ring removals, and overall a lot of minor work on both vehicles. This was also while an investigation by the Fish and Wildlife Service was ongoing into the impact of the deluge system on the local wildlife in Boca Chica. This investigation needed to be closed before the FAA would modify the launch license to allow Flight 2. Booster 9 also performed another test on the orbital launch mount, its second static fire. This time, all 33 Raptor engines on the booster ignited, with two shutting down shortly after ignition. This is the first event that we are aware of where all 33 engines on a booster ignited successfully, if only for a moment, at the same time. While the flight stack was ready, the stack for the third flight also performed testing. In September, Booster 10 and Ship 28 performed proof testing at Massey's ahead of engine installation. We got some Cybertruck full stack photo shoots as well, as it towed a Raptor vacuum engine through Boca Chica. Sean's picture of this even made it onto a metal print and on the front page of our 2024 Starbase calendar. Both are available at shop.nasaspaceflight.com. Shifting forwards to October, we saw Ship 26 coming to life with an unusual static fire. SpaceX later confirmed it was a single engine static fire demonstrating flight like startup burn for a Starship deorbit burn. This concluded Ship 26's usefulness so far as it is not planned for a flight. Also, it performed a pre burner test, which we had not seen for a very long time. Needless to say, our commentators were a tad confused. The same week as this test, the Fish and Wildlife Service was seen surveying the landscape surrounding the orbital launch pad, presumably to assist with their report into the environmental impact of the new flame deflector. On that same day, some pale-skinned Brit was caught by Jack. I have no idea who that could be. At the beginning of November, we were almost there, until suddenly another D-stack happened. A few hours before the flight, SpaceX performed a grid fin test, which revealed the need to replace at least one grid fin actuator on the booster. The next flight attempt was then planned for November 18th. And to the amazement of practically everybody, including us, it flew on the first attempt. And it flew all right. The first stage debuted the so-called Mega Mark Diamond, as all 33 engines of Super Heavy ignited and performed perfectly up to Miko. The booster and ship separated successfully in the hot staging maneuver, and even all six second stage engines ignited without complaint. After that, the booster seemed to tumble during its boost back burn as the engines most likely had a problem with fuel sloshing. This resulted in the termination of the flight using the beefed up FTS. The ship performed up until close to the end of its burn, where it also was terminated in flight. It is not clear yet what exactly happened to the ship, however, the second flight of Starship looked miles better than the first one. Quite literally if you consider how much further downrange it got. No rock tornado, no raptor cannibalism, no flip, and doing a kerbal. And this brings us to the current playing field. The pad seems mostly fine, so SpaceX hit the ground running for Flight 3 preparations. The tank farm for the orbital launch pad is undergoing massive updates, both in storage and processing capability, and both sections of the flight vehicle have ramped up testing at a mind-boggling pace. 
At the beginning of December, the Chopsticks were already getting ready to lift a new booster onto the pad, and just a few days ago, in a Christmas-themed rollout, we saw Ship 28 going to the launch site. What followed was one of the most impressive turnarounds we have ever seen. The rollout was completed, Ship 28 was put on the pad, and instantly SpaceX moved into Spin Prime testing just a day later. And just days after that, they successfully fired six engines on the ship. SpaceX tweeted, Flight 3 Starship completed a full duration static fire with all six of its Raptor engines. And that's not all. Booster 10 rolled to the launch site and was put on the pad just a month after Flight 2. Remember, between Flight 1 and Flight 2, this took three times longer. So essentially, SpaceX has successfully deleted two months out of the flow. Booster 10 already performed an attempted static fire on December 21st, however, in the middle of the propellant load, it seems the test was aborted due to unknown reasons. And with that, this is where we are right now, at the end of 2023. We saw two flights of Starship, six vehicle static fires, a lot of spin prime and cryo tests, numerous experimental test articles, a brand new mega bay, a brand new factory, and much, much more and nothing is slowing down. The future promises even more action, an even quicker pace, and of course the kickoff of the core work of the human landing system for the Artemis 3 mission. If you thought 2023 was exciting, well, I'd recommend you stick around for 2024 because we'll be bringing you everything as it happens. Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. For a 30-day free trial and 20% off an annual premium subscription, check out the link below. Merry Christmas, thanks for watching, and goodbye.